Perfect. Afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Um, my name is Lauren Roberts, and I'm the advocacy lead for the City and Guilds Foundation. Um, a real pleasure to be with you all this lunchtime afternoon. Um, I'm super happy to host today's session, which, as you all know, is about bringing together businesses who um, are lucky enough to have a super large levy pot um, and have some left over and unspent. We'll also be bringing together business on the other side of that um, who may not have their own levy um, but have some real apprenticeship ambitions and would like to receive funds um, to be able to offer apprenticeships through the amazing platform that is the co-op levy share. So before I go through the agenda quickly, um, I'd love to welcome my co-hosts, Louise Timpley and Sandra Kelly um, from co-op. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, just a quick hello from me, just to say that um, it's been a real privilege being uh, able to work on Co-op Levy Share. And thank you very much to City and Guilds Foundation for bringing us all together today. And hopefully you'll find the, uh, the next uh, hour or so really interesting and, and want to get involved in, in what we're working on. I'll just hand over to Sandra to say hello as well. Hello, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, again, looking forward to telling you all about Co-op Levy Share. Thank you both. Great to have you with us today. So I'm just going to quickly run through the agenda um, just so everybody knows what is going on. Um, so first of all, we're going to have a Oh, we're going to have a session hosted by Paula Gibson, uh, my colleague from City and Guilds, and she's going to take us through a little bit about the apprenticeship levy as a whole. So what is it um, and where, where is it currently at, essentially? Um, then we're going to have Tiana Locker, um, also from City and Guilds, who is going to run through some of the inequality that exists within apprenticeships and how we can tackle that, um, along with the underrepresentation that many of us know exists. Then we'll have Louise and Sandra coming back, as I said, from the co-op, who are going to run through um, the co-op levy share platform, the service, um, um, how it can be used. There's also a little bit of a demo of the site on there. Um, and then we'll hear from some employees who actually use the platform. So we'll hear from Green Corps, Autism Initiatives, Per Temps and William Hare on their experiences of either um, donating money to the platform, being able to support apprenticeship programmes or receiving money from the platform um, and being able to offer apprenticeship programmes through it. We'll then have a Q&A at the end. So if you do have any questions, just a little bit of housekeeping, if you just pop them into the chat or into the Q&A function, um, we'll get around to those at the end. And any questions that aren't answered, we'll be sure to um, build it through to the right person and get back to you with an answer. Um, and that should take us to the end time. So um, first session, I'm going to hand over to Paula Gibson um, to go back to basics for us on the apprenticeship levy. Thanks, Lauren. Um, and just to in introduce myself. Um, hello, everyone. Really delighted to be here today. Um, I'm going to take you through a bit of a backstory in terms of the levy. Um, and more crucially, um, how it's landed over the last few years and where we are now. Um, so just to give you a bit of background um, to, to the levy, and apologies, you probably know all of this, but I just think it's worth refreshing. So the government obviously introduced the levy in 2017, um, which feels a very long time ago now. Um, and it was all about designing a brand new apprenticeship reform to fundamentally put employers at the very heart of the system, of the new apprenticeship system, um, which meant that, um, you know, lots of employers had complete visibility in terms of how, you know, the cost of training was and how and, and, and giving them almost the, the control in terms of how they were to use um, their, you know, their apprenticeship levy um, to, 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 to run their training programmes for them. Um, I think what happened, uh, you know, around about that time as well um, was um, a whole set of funding changes, funding rule changes as well, um, which kind of really impacted, I think, on, 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 on many of um, um, employees ability to actually utilize their levy which is why we're in a situation now where we have lots of employers who um have unspent funds which is really the the essence of today um so um let's just let's just remind ourselves so it was implemented in 2017 and um, now when so, so as great as the levy was in terms of a game changer, it still only impacted on 5% of employers who had a wage bill of more than 3 million per year. You know, the majority of apprenticeships are still being delivered today through SMEs um, and through other small businesses and um, charities, etc. which is why I think today's conversation is really, really important. 
Um, so the levy obviously was um, um, impacting on um, a wage bill of uh, where they had to pay 0% of their salary bill. Um, but one of the big crucial changes is that um, if an employer didn't spend that levy uh, within two years and those funds would start to expire. Um, but actually the opportunity and just to say that, you know, from my background, I was very much part of developing the policy re reforms back in the uh, days when I was at the um, Education Skills Funding Agency. Um, and then I and then I went on to work into a large le levy paying organisation, the fourth largest levy paying organisation. Um, actually, so it so I actually have experience of both designing the policy, but also then implementing the policy. So I can see some of the great things that happened as a result of the levy. And I think what some of these large employers actually were able to do because of the levy was to really kind of start to build their own in-house apprenticeship teams. And um, they were able to develop a center of excellence. So they were really able to kind of, you know, really think about their apprenticeship programs and start to build more uh, apprenticeship pipeline for new recruits, but also also existing staff as well so I think it worked in many many ways and, and, and there are so many great success stories where you know em, em, employees have got some great apprenticeship programs award-winning programs actually and um, so during my time at the National Apprenticeship Service we celebrated lots of employers who, 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 who have built and you know made really successful apprenticeship programs but I suppose if you fast forward to where we are now thanks Stuart um, you know, in terms of 2022, you know, what are the key um, the key findings? Um, I think it's fair to say that um, whilst it's worked in so many ways, there are also some shortcomings, which means that, you know, we know that quite a substantial amount of funds have been um, sent back to Treasury. Um, and I think some of that is because, you know, some of these employers who have very, very large levy pots, they were never, ever going to be able to spend all of that because of the rules in, you know, in terms of what the levy can be used for. And I spent a lot of my time, actually, um, you know, in 2019 uh, onwards, really trying to kind of help this sector understand what can be used for, you know, what you can spend your levy on and what you can't spend your levy on. And there was a lot of misconceptions back in the, you know, in the first days of the levy uh, around what well, can you use it for? Um, for staff wages, no. Can you use it for subsistence, for travel? No. The funding rules were very, very stringent in terms of, you, you, you know, you could only spend that levy um, on the delivery of apprenticeships, which are linked to apprenticeship standards, which each have a funding band. And that's precisely where that levy can be spent. So it is it is very tied down into, into some very strict funding loops, uh, rules. So what happened was a substantial amount of levy funds were going back into, into, into the Treasury and some research that was carried out by the CIPD um, found that uh, the tune of two of, of two billion actually uh, were returned to the treasury, which is a phenomenal amount, um, and that's still happening today. I think the other thing as well, and funding drives behaviour. You know, I don't need to tell uh, everyone on 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 here about what that actually means in practice. So because. The, the apprenticeship reforms created lots of new standards, lots of management standards, and because the apprenticeship rules meant that you could actually pay for new recruits, but also existing staff could do an apprenticeships. So you found that a lot of managers were being put onto some of these expensive apprenticeship programs, and some of these standards were actually to the tune of twenty eight, uh, sorry, twenty seven thousand um, pounds, in terms of the funding bands. A lot of that's not happening anymore because the government, I think, reflected on that and reduced the, some of the funding bans for some of those um, expensive management standards. But when we first started on this journey, we saw a lot of employers using their levy to spend on generic management apprenticeships. So what is the impact of that? The impact of that is that, you know, a lot of young people were potentially missing out on what the government found, you know, th thought would be a fantastic reform of apprenticeships. A lot of young people were not being able to access it because what we did see was more and more 25 plus um, people actually going on to an apprenticeship. So the impact, again, obviously, lots and lots of young people, lots and lots of employers with great apprenticeship programmes, not really being able to access some of these levy funds. Um, thanks, Stuart. Actually, what I should say, the co-investment model, which, you know, the government... Um, contributed 90% and the employer contrib uh, contributed 10% was you know obviously still still there as well and supporting SMEs but clearly a, a missed opportunity with some of the funds that aren't being utilized um, so so just to kind of um, bring us back to the here and now, um, obviously what this initiative does and you'll hear lots more from from uh, from people on, on the session today 
um, is uh, whilst the employer, uh, sorry, the apprenticeship reforms were designed to put employers at the heart of apprenticeships, um, I think some of the research is showing that, you know, lots of young people um, haven't really, you know, benefited, I suppose, from some of the opportunities. Um, and actually what the apprenticeship reforms haven't done to an extent is actually address some of the bigger issues around social mobility and diversity based on some of the research that you've seen. And there's loads and loads of research out there as well, not just what the CIPD have commissioned. Um, so obviously the levy um, sharing initiative with the co-op and City and Guilds is about transforming um, apprenticeships in terms of you know allowing a much more flexible approach and um, to support training and development through apprenticeships and um, we're also seeing um the skill shortages becoming a bit of a concern as well or skills crisis i think somebody actually referred to me uh, the other day um especially around some of the key areas like digital it construction health and social care so whilst the apprenticeship levy was a game change in many respects we're still in a situation where we're facing some serious skill shortages across some of these key key sectors and i think something like the level sh the levy share initiative will go some way to addressing that uh, through a much more flexible approach so that's all I wanted to say about the levy I'm going to hand back to you Lauren now to uh, to continue with the session thank you thank you so much Paula um, so much great information and really helped to set the scene uh, that last slide leads perfectly um, into our next section um, which is going to be hosted by Tiana Locker um, who's going to talk to us about some of the inequality and underrepresentation um, seen in apprenticeships um, and how um, at City and Guilds um, we're looking at tackling that so over to you Tiana Thanks, Lauren. Um, so yeah, like Lauren um, just said, I'm the early talent manager at City and Guilds. Um, and my role is really to make sure that we have a really clear strategic direction in terms of our apprenticeship program and more widely early talent to make sure that we are bringing in, in ta talent into the organization in the best way possible, but really making sure that we have a clear um, inclusion diversity lens on it to make sure that we have a really well-rounded well, well, well program. Um, the first thing that I'd like to do is just give you a little bit of context around our strategy. Um, we believe that if we have a strategic approach in our early talent, we will be able to better support our purpose, our future, our strategy, and actually the culture of our workforce. Um, so when I often talk to people about this, the reason we think that's really important is because apprenticeships are a really great platform to bring in people with brand new great ideas into your organization, but also to shape and mold them. So we see this as a really great opportunity for our organization. Um, we really want to make sure that we're engaging with and building a diverse talent pool um, and making sure that we are developing their skills and experience, whilst also actually making sure that they have the right level of organizational awareness and also developing their careers within our organization. So for us, it's really important to make sure we've got that win-win. So as an organization, we're able to make sure we've got the right experience internally by putting them on an apprenticeship program but actually at the same time making sure we're giving back something to them so they have a really great career whilst they're with us and um, so through our apprenticeship strategy or early talent strategy we think that we're able to build the right knowledge skills and behaviors that we want to drive our culture internally um, something else that's really important that we hope our strategy will do for us is around really leading by example. So anyone that knows City and Guilds really knows that apprenticeships are really at the heart of what we do. And we really want to be able to make sure that we are, um, you know, sipping our own champagne, for example, making sure that we understand our own products and services. And we know that the advice that we give to all of our customers and employers, we're actually using that in-house. Um, but at the same time, making sure that we're really diverse in terms of the talent pool that we're engaging with and make sure they've got all the right opportunities available for them. Um, and then the last thing is really around um, supporting workforce planning. So we are doing a lot of work at the moment on our strategy, and we really wanna make sure that we're identifying some skills gaps that we need to make sure um, that we need it within the organization and using a print ships to fill some of those gaps for us. Fab. Um, so the way that we're really doing this is by creating um, an early talent pathway, by having a series of different interventions that we can engage with people over a number of years, which will really support them to get to know us as an employer, um, so they can start to feel comfortable. And most importantly, when we think about things like diversity um, and underrepresented groups, we know that one of the biggest challenges they have is actually having a professional network. So by engaging with people over a number of years, we can start to be in their professional network and they can start to see us 
as an employer of choice and actually an employer that they feel comfortable and safe with. Um, so the first thing that we do is we have open days, um, which are usually one day sessions um, where we have the opportunity engage, to engage with people from loads of different groups. And the great things about open days is that you can really um, focus them on different um, different groups. So you could do one, let's say, for younger people. You can do one for people who are, let's say, returning mums. If you want diversity, you can really target your audience um, based on the content that you want to deliver and who you want to engage for your programmes. Um, so the sessions usually talk a little bit about our organisation, who we are, what we do. Um, but then it's also important that we give them something that they can walk away with. So we give them information on interview techniques and employability skills so that when they want to apply for either roles of us or somewhere externally they feel that they've got something that can really support them um, and then of course at the end of the session we'll tell them about all of the opportunities that they could apply for with us um, we then encourage those people to apply for things like work experience which is usually even one or two weeks long and it's really focused on them building up awareness of those really important soft skills that employers really talk about um, if we had somebody come for an interview um, we're really clear on those core skills that we'd like to see in those candidates so we make sure that we raise their awareness and give them some tangible experience to be able to talk to to be able to talk about that at an interview. Um, from work experience, we'd encourage them to go for a longer placement, which might be something like our summer internship program, which is usually around about six weeks long. Um, and this is really about them having that longer term um, workplace confidence and competence. So them completing tangible tasks um, and having those examples to go away at interview so them really understanding what it means to for example work within our marketing team or our finance team and being able to go into an interview confidently and demonstrate some of the skills that they've learned um, and then most importantly because they've spent a much longer time with us they start to feel as though they have a professional network and um, from that what we um, make sure we have is um, apprenticeship opportunities so once they've had the chance to engage with us we have apprenticeship roles which they can get then go into um, and that's how we really start to build them into our workforce and make sure that they have longer term career opportunities with us and once they finish on an apprenticeship program they then become our employees and we'll see them having longer term continued career progression inside of the organization Thanks, Stuart. Um, so now I'm just going to talk about um, some of the ways that we try to attract um, diverse candidates. And I think this is really important. So when we think about um, wanting to support people from those different groups, I think one of the biggest challenges we've faced is around actually identifying and engaging with them. So we do lots of different work on this. And so this is our, our general route to market when we are trying to get our diverse talent pools. Um, so one of the things that was really important over the past few months was identifying different diverse job boards which would attract people to our um, apprenticeship roles and we've got a number of different um, job boards that we use across the organization um, that we will use for various different levels but the one that we found works particularly well for us for our entry level roles is black young professionals so we're doing a lot of work at the moment with black young professionals to make sure that we're regularly advertising our opportunities and engaging with them so that all of their candidates can see our opportunities um, another thing that we do is engagement with schools and colleges, and um, that's really important for us, and it's, it's quite a task because there are so many that you can engage with, but one of the things that we've identified that works really well is um, particularly engaging with those who are in 50% of the most deprived areas of the UK, and those who also have high volumes of students receiving full school, free school meals. So that just shows us that if we are engaging with those schools, we're more than likely reaching the people that most need the opportunities within our organisation and most likely don't have the professional networks that I was talking about previously. Um, and then the other thing that we like to do is actually tap into the foundation and use their existing relationships with charity partners. So we're really lucky that we have the charitable arm of our organization who really focus on our purpose. And they have so many different charity partners that we can engage with, such as the Girls Foundation, the Change Foundation, St. Giles. And we often send information to these different charities about our apprenticeship opportunities. Um, and when we find that they have enough engagement, we, like I said at the beginning, we could put on open days again to speak about those particular opportunities so they can talk to us one-on-one -on -one and find out more firsthand about what the opportunity is that they can apply for. Um, 
And then this is just a little bit about the overall recruitment process. So like I said, um, attraction is really important for us. So making sure that we've got targeted talent pools. So where possible, um, having particular community groups that we can regularly engage with and um, make sure they're always up to date with when our next cohort recruitment might be, for example. So making sure you can provide as much information up front is really important for us. Um, and that's also really important because it's about building that brand, employer brand up with them so that they know us um, rather than them just having a random email out and then they don't want to apply. Um, the second thing would be around selection methods. So it's really important that it's consistent and objective. One of the things that we do internally is make sure that we have resourcing champions um, to make sure that we have enough diversity on our boards, for example, or our interview panels. So something that's quite new for us is we're going to be bringing our apprentices into our all of our apprentice interviews. So it brings that diversity immediately and it helps anybody that's applying for our roles to feel a bit more comfortable um, when they go for their apprenticeship interview. Um, and the last thing is around career progression. So it's really important to think about what's going to happen at the end of the apprenticeship. Um, so making sure that we're internal talent led. So making sure that we really prioritize our internal apprentices and think about their next steps and the next role that they'll be, be able to go on to. Um, so constantly having those career conversations and thinking about what roles they might want to apply for next. And that's pretty much um, a bit of a summary of our overall strategy um, internally for apprenticeships and early talent. Thank you so much, Tiana. Um, as someone who started their career at Sitting Girls and Apprentice a few years ago, it's so amazing to see just kind of the whole, all the thinking and the structure that goes behind making a programme what it is and kind of all the great work that you're doing to attract um, everyone, which is so great. Um, I'm gonna hand back over to Louise and Sandra now, um, who are going to host uh, this mini session, just actually about the amazing platform we've all been alluding to, um, and then inviting some employers um, on also to share their thoughts. Great, thank you, Lauren. Thank you, Tiana. You took the words right out of my mouth, Lauren, when you were talking about the strategy and how clear it was then. And it's so wonderful to see the uh, the focus on underrepresentation and, and a really positive strategy to do something about that. Um, just I wanted to start by going back to what Paula was saying about the introduction of the apprenticeship levy. And I, I'm very grateful to that because in uh, in uh, February 2017, I was recruited by Co-op to um, to do some work with co-op's big levy um, and again to put things into context, context with numbers the levy that the co-op has to spend is just over five million pounds every year because we've got over sixty thousand colleagues so it was a great opportunity for us as a business to look at how we could really develop our our own apprenticeship strategy um, and recruit more apprentices into our business but also use it for, for upskill even with a, a new strategy and a clear direction we found that we've only been able to spend about two million pounds a year of our five million pound pot. And then when you start to see after the two years had passed, you start to see the funds expiring and going back to Treasury. We really wanted to do something about it. And we knew that we had the opportunity to transfer some of our levy. And many of you will be familiar with the fact that it's now a 25% um, transfer pot. So we wanted to do something about it. And we started to have a think about how we could share our levy and how we could make a difference as well. And when we looked at some of the data from the um, National Apprenticeship Service, looking at some of the areas of underrepresentation, such as different um, inequalities in, in gender, perhaps some uh, shortages of individuals coming through from the lower socioeconomic areas, and some of the, uh, the, the, the race um, inequality that was appearing in the apprenticeship stats as well, we got our thinking caps on and came up with co-op levy share. And basically, this is a way, as we've said already, large businesses who've got a, a, a big levy pot that they can't spend, being able to decide who they want to share their levy with and doing it in a really proactive way. Um, and if I hand over to Sandra now, she'll just talk you through some of the mechanics of uh, the levy share and I'll come back to talk about some of the, the stats. Okay. okay, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I actually work uh, behind the scenes uh, for Co-op Levy Share and Really, what, what actually happens here is any um, large organisation or even, well, um, both uh, large organisations and small organisations can register onto the portal. Uh, obviously, the large organisations are the ones that's got this excess, excess um, apprenticeship levy that they want to um, transfer. The smaller organisations are, are the ones that 
uh, wanting support um, financially to support the apprenticeship, the apprentices that they're putting through uh, an apprenticeship. It's very, it's a very easy process to actually register onto the onto the portal. Um, and I want to make make that point at this point that actually there is help um, in the background to to enable you to do that. And um, so it's it's actually uh, available, like I say, to both organisations to actually register onto the portal. Once those register once those regist registrations have been done, I then work in the, again work in the background to match. The, the large organizations that's got this, this pot of, of levy that they want to uh, transfer with the uh, other organizations that are in need of that support um, and actually try and match the two organizations together. Um, and as, as Louise has said, it actually gives the, um, the what we call the donating organization um, the facility to actually to be able to choose who they want to support. Um, I could go on for hours and hours and hours to be truthful um, about, about the portal, uh, but you'd get bored of my and not so much enthusiasm, but um, I, I feel it's just such a fantastic um, opportunity for both uh, large organisations and, and small organisations. But once that match has been made, um, if, like you say, in, in the background, it's again a very simple process for the, the large organization to make a connection request um, or with the, the smaller ag, uh, organization seeking that support. I, again, I then step in to actually take them through that process. And particularly again, you know, with, with the smaller, smaller organizations, um, that help is there to actually uh, let them understand the process that they need to, to actually make that transfer happen. Um, but it, it's, you know, the, the system is there for, for everybody to use. Um, and like, like I said before, really, just to stress, particularly with obviously this co-op uh, levy share portal, there is help and assistance in the background um, to help you do that. This is just a, an example here of the, of the website. The, the email address uh, is at the top right hand corner there together with um, a direct telephone number to myself. Um, so if anybody has any questions um, or needs any advice or assistance, uh, I'm always there at the other end of the telephone to help them through. And as you can see there from the, the right hand side there, there is a, a registration button um, and, and that just takes you to the registration page where really all it does is, that, is actually ask you for details of, of your business. Um, contact details, you need to set up a, um, you know, a log it, login details with password, um, but it's really just the, your basic um, uh, business information. Um, so you would have all that information to hand uh, in any, any way. And then for the organisations wanting to um, uh, post an opportunity where they're actually seeking support, you'll see the box there on, on the right hand when you actually go back in. Um, you, all you need to do then is to sub, submit an opportunity um, for the donating organisations to actually see um, and, you know, to see if they actually want to uh, support your opportunity. Um, and it, it's just been, it, it's been overwhelming, to be truthful, the, the support that everybody's been given and um, just please, please use it. That's, that's all, that's all I'd like to say. And, and again, you know, the help, help and uh, assistance is there in, in the background. Fabulous. Thank you, Sandra, for taking us through that. Um, and this next slide, really, it just is a few of the numbers. Um, when we started, it was 6th of May, 2021. Uh, we, we set off with an initial target of trying to raise 5 million. Um, and just to, to emphasise, when we say raise, it's a case of businesses sort of virtually pledging because uh, we've, we've just got a notional um, amount that people say that they want to spend. And then it's up to those individual businesses to, to use that through their own apprenticeship service account. So 10.3 million pledged to date from a wonderful 37 organisations. So some of those donations are pretty high. Some of them are a lot lower. It doesn't matter. However much you've got to spare, we'd be really, really happy to, to receive some of those pledges. 
And just to also mention, there are other uh, levy transfer services available. Um, the uh, um, Education and Skills Funding Agency released theirs in autumn, um, and there are other local um, organisations as well. But um, what, we, what we think we can really provide with this one is the wonderful Sandra in the background <laughs> um, doing all the work for us to make sure that if you've got a particular type of business or type of sector that you want to support, um, then we can find those businesses for you who need apprentices. 545 apprenticeships have been matched already um, and 439 have already started with us. So we're really, really pleased with the success and that's testament to all the work uh, that the different businesses have um, have got behind and supported us with. And I think now it's a, a good idea to bring to life some of those numbers. So um, I'm going to start by asking, I think it's Carmen, uh, no, sorry, it's not, it's Matthew and Kate um, to talk to us. And I think Leanne's joining this conversation as well about the, uh, the apprenticeship story that they've got. I'll hand over, thank you. Um, shall I start um, just talking about some um, an organisation that has received donations and we will kindly receive donations from Green Corps. So um, Matthew will tell you more about that in a minute. Um, Autism Initiatives is a nationwide charity and it's a levy paying um, organisation also. <clears throat> but we don't have enough levy um, funds of our own to be able to support the development of our staff. Um, so we've used the levy co-op levy portal to get transfers of gifted levy to support our staff to enrol onto qualifications. So we don't actually recruit apprenticeships, but our staff do apprenticeship standards. Um, we find that's best for the nature of the roles that they, they're undertaking, that they are employed staff who do apprenticeships rather than apprentices doing personal care and things like that. Um, the co-op levy portal was so easy to use. It was very responsive. So as soon as I would put up a vacancy that we, ha we had, Sandra would be in touch with us um, and would, you know, put us in touch with other organisations who were willing to donate to us. And I can only say that, you know, our own levy only covers a quarter of our apprenticeship needs each year. So we really do benefit from any kinds of gifts because as a charity, we have very limited funds to be able to pay for that extra 5% if we had to pay the extra 5% if we ran out of levy. So I can only say that the co-op levy share has made my job a lot easier. It's made our staff a lot happier because they've been able to enroll on the qualifications that they require for their role. And it's also benefited benefited the support that our staff are giving to the people um, with autism that they're supporting because they're qualified, they understand what they're doing and they know the reasons why they're doing it. And Leanne, who's here today, will be able to tell you a bit about her experience as an apprenticeship, um, doing an apprenticeship at Autism Initiatives. Fabulous, thank you, Kate. Leanne, do you want to share your story with us now and then we'll ask Matthew to uh, to talk to us from Green Corps. Hi, Leanne. Thank you. Hey, yeah. Um, I done my level two with yourselves as well. Um, I started off as a support worker. I built myself up to a senior support worker, and now I'm an acting my um, service manager, doing my level three um, apprentice. Fabulous. So, what what's the level three apprenticeship that you're doing, Leanne? Um, health and social care. And so can you just describe to us what you're doing on a daily basis with some of your clients? Yeah, of course. Um, personal care, we take them out. Um, we also take them to day centre. We cook for them, but get them involved in what we're doing with them. So if they're capable of doing something, then we encourage them to do a bit more of what we know that they're capable of. Um, we take them to see parents if the parents can't come and see them. Um, just basically day to day things that we do, we help do with do with them as well. Um, personal care, bath them, um, continent pads. 
Oh, it's a fantastic job you're doing there, Leanne. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for sharing that, that story with us and, and to you, Kate. And Matthew, are you on the call to I know your it's your levy from Green Corps that's enabled this to happen? Yeah, yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, uh, my name is Matthew Watson. Um, as you've heard, uh, I'm uh, from Green Corps and we are one of the pledging businesses um, uh, as part of this, you know, this opportunity as part of the, the portal and what we're here to discuss today. Um, I just wanted to say really quickly that it's been amazing today to hear from everyone, um, particularly from yourself, Leanne, and, and actually hear, you know, what impact all of our, you know, efforts here are having. Um, really, really positive. So thank you for coming on and sharing that. Um, in terms of ourselves, um, as, as a business, uh, we got into, uh, into levy sharing through using you know, the co-op portal um, as part of our inclusion and diversity work within our business. So uh, about this time, a little bit earlier than this last year, we, um, we kind of re-examined re our strategy at Green Corps, what we wanted to do as a business with inclusion and diversity. And it was actually through that, through some of the work we do with co-op separate to this, um, that we heard about this amazing opportunity and we made our pledge, I think it was about this time last year, um, it was April last year, I think, when we made our pledge. Um, all I can say is that it, it's been a brilliant opportunity. Um, it, it's so easy to use. I know we've heard a little bit about it today, about the portal, how intuitive it is. It really is as simple as it looked on that slide. It's as simple as Sandra made it sound, it really is. Um, I think it took me the grand total of about two or three minutes to set up my account. And then as we saw, you can get on there, you can look at everything that's on there already, all the different things as a business, you can go on and pledge funds to. Uh, you've got the opportunity to filter them down. So if you're looking for certain areas and um, certain regions across the, across the country, um, you can filter that down. Um, it's just, there's so much on there you can do. And then having that added kind of uh, level of support in the background from Sandra, from the growth company, really does make a huge difference um, and really does help support at all kinds of levels, both sides, as you heard from Kate as well, not just from a pledging business. Um, yeah, can't kind of, uh, you know, blow the trumpet enough for the portal, really. So just thank you for all those in the background. And if you're thinking about getting involved or, you know, you've got a little bit of money to donate, please do so, because it makes such a huge difference to not only the businesses, but to the individuals as well. Oh, thank you so much, Matthew. And and just picking up on that piece there about um, some of your, the reasons for you getting involved was to look at some of your equality and diversity initiatives. Yeah. Um, just a bit of data that we've been able to, to gather. It's only since January, actually, because we have we had some challenges early on in the process of actually trying to, to get information on some of the apprentices that we were supporting. Um, but we found that since January, we've got 37% of our apprentices who are from non-white British backgrounds, 70% are female, 43% have got a recorded disability, and 49% have got caring responsibilities. So we're really showing evidence of being able to tackle some of that underrepresentation, and we'll continue to, to build that data. Um, I mean, they're just numbers, really. But when we hear stories about individuals, it, it really does make a difference to us and, and spurs us on to, to get more and more involved in, in the service. And with, with that in mind, um, I'll just hand over to, to Carmen and to Kerry, who are going to talk to us about um, the levy share opportunity that, that they've um, been working on. Hello, can you hear me? We can, Carmen, yes. Oh, it's all right. I've just taken my earplugs out because I tend to get um, a vibration. Well, well, first of all, I'd say what fantastic, fantastic presentation. Uh, even though I've been involved in the in the process, it's great to hear uh, some of what you've been doing. I would... Have you got an echo? No. no. Everything, Everything I'm echoing back to me. Let me try. Sorry about that. Um, I would love to put pretty much by like co speaker. But we, we did this for DNI and all the rest of it, of it. But, we but we didn't. didn't. Um, um, it was it simply that we had so much money that we were unable to spend, and we felt, felt really aggrieved really at the prospect, prospect of handing this call, this call and employment, employment tax, tax back to HMRC. <laughs> um, so, 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 so that, that was, was a really for it. It. But, but, I, but I have, I have to say, to say um, I think the I think whole, the whole thing, thing has been speech. superb. We're, We're a recruitment, recruitment company, company. so uh, while 40,000 of our employed workers would be contingent workers that are going out on our behalf to other clients, clients. We, still we still have, have to pay apprenticeship levy on them. It's a, it's a lot, lot of money. money. And, and we have, we have been, been unable, unable to, to spend the, 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 the money, money. Um, despite, despite all the attempts to, to lobby, lobby to get 
yeah, the flexibility. So we've been delighted really to be able to share it. Now, in fairness, with the co-op, uh, just because of timing and nothing else, um, our pledges have been lower than they have been to some other areas. But I think certainly going forward in the future, as the ones that we've already got running fall off, we would be more than happy um, to push it in the co-op's direction. I think um, I echo all of the points that everybody's raised. The system is so easy to use. Um, it's incredible. Um, Sandra is always there. I think we've probably asked her the same question about three or four times, but it's never a problem. She comes back and answers us very politely and is hugely supportive. And I think, and then finally, um, I read an article recently where um, the young lady that you'll hear from in a moment, who's doing the um, apprenticeship at, at uh, William Hare, really does, to me, encapsulate what this whole thing is about. So I would just absolutely encourage anybody, anywhere, to be using it and pledging towards it and putting the vacancies on there as well. Lovely, thank you so much, Carmen. And, and Kerry, do you want to tell us about your apprenticeship? Yes, um, I've got two slides. Um, if Stuart could pop those up for me, please. So I think first and foremost, I would like to say a massive thank you to Carmen and to Per Temps um, for, for, for your uh, levy donation. So just some, some basic background really about William Hare. So we're a structural steel company. Um, we design, fabricate um, and erect huge big steel structures. So places like uh, the Trafford Centre. Um, we are levy payers. Um, but we're not a huge company. So our levy is around £150,000 a year. And previously, when people talked about the different funding bands and those at that sort of, you know, higher level, our funding bands are at a higher level because it's engineering. Um, so our levy doesn't particularly stretch that far, if I'm honest with you. We do have, at the moment, 7.6% of, of our workforce are apprentices. Um, we do take on quite a lot of apprentices each year. Now, last year, I was one, one lot of funding short for one of our apprentices. Um, and it was, and I'll come to who this young lady is in a moment, but, you know, she's female, um, really, really keen to take her on, but had no levy money left. So um, I found out about the co-op um, levy share and spoke to the shining star that is Sandra, um, who literally taught me through it. It could not have been simpler. So obviously at the time, even though we use our online system for levy, uh, the DAS, as I think most DAS system, as most of us call it, um, that, that whole levy sharing and transfer didn't exist on there at the time. Um, so the co-op levy share was absolutely perfect. I will, you know, say what everybody else has said, the form was incredibly easy to fill in. Registration was simple. It's the personal touch that I love about this because the minute you fill those forms in um, or you register, you get a phone call from Sandra, um, you know, and she's an absolute pleasure to deal with. Nothing is too much trouble. It's really got the personal touch, with, which I love. I know now we can use our own sort of DAS levy system to, to ask for money. Um, I, I still haven't used it because there is no personal touch there. You, you, you put your, you know, your, your information in, you say what you want and you keep your fingers crossed that somebody matches and gets in touch with you. Whereas doing it this way through the co-op, you have that personal touch. I can speak to Sandra whenever I want, you know, she phones me, I phone her. So for this year, we're taking 30 apprentices. Um, I was just about to say all young people, but some of them are in the 30s. I don't know whether they consider themselves that young. I don't know. But they're all brand new apprentices. Um, a lot of them, it's their first job, their first career. I need around £700,000 worth of levy funding for this year. Um, I've probably got half of that. So I'm having to look for half of that through levy transfer. So as I said, why did I come back to the co-op levy share? It's ease of use um, and Sandra, you know, Sandra, we just pick the phone up and we speak and it, it, it does make life so much easier. So the most important person in all this who is on the next slide 
is our Zafira. Um, so Zafira um, out, left school, um, 16, wasn't sure exactly what she wanted to do. Um, we have a great relationship with the school that Zafira goes to. Um, and we've done work experience with them and we go and do careers events with them and we do online virtual events. Um, Zafira heard about us through her school and one of her teachers said, look, if, if you're interested in engineering, you won't go far wrong going to William Hare for an apprenticeship. So actually we were delighted when Zafira applied, because as you can imagine, you know, fabrication and welding, um, it, it's very male dominated. Um, we do have a few ladies uh, and a few girls that um, are fabricator welders. Not enough because actually they're absolute perfectionists. Um, and they're really, really keen on making sure the job they do is, is really good. They're great at college. So Zafira started with us in September um, last year. At the moment, she's doing four days in college and she's doing one day in the workplace. That will carry on for around 10 months. Um, so and she's doing absolutely brilliant in college and in the workplace. And also the nice thing is she's also the first member of her family to work in engineering. Um, so we're absolutely delighted in terms of Zafira being with us. So as I say, you know, we are looking for more young people this year and um, we have already done some interviews and we've had a real diverse mix of, of young people. So in the past, we generally our managers would have had, um, you know, the, the, the same group of people who work in engineering put in front of them um, now we're very much more um, diverse in terms of the people that we attract. I work with lots of different schools that are very diverse, do have a high number of pupils who are on free school meals. So it means that nowadays in terms of, you know, the levy and the apprenticeships that we do have, a, we, we're starting to get a far more diverse workforce, but we want lots more of Zafira because she's amazing. So thank you again, Carmen. You're very welcome. Brilliant. Thank, Thank you, you, Kerry. Thank you, Carmen. What fabulous stories there. I think I'm now handing back to, to Lauren in case you've got any questions through on the chat. Perfect. Thank you so much, uh, Louise, for hosting that session. Thank you so much to all of our speakers today. So Paula, Tiana, Kate, Leanne, Matthew, Carmen and Kerry. Um, thank you so much for jumping on. Great to hear some of those real life stories. I think, as you said, Louise, um, it's really easy to just talk about a platform, which is great, which is obviously great. Um, but to actually hear people that have used it and actually benefit from it on the ground um, just makes it so much more real. So thank you so much. Um, we're now going to have a quick um, 10, 11 minutes for questions if anybody has any. Um, we have just popped to kind of an ask in the chat, um, but as it is a meeting, if anybody wants to just jump off mute and switch their camera on or not and ask a question, feel free to do so now. Give it a few seconds. Uh, I'll ask one. Um, just in terms of the d and I, I, I'm aware that you're focusing on the diverse aspect, but it's not just that, is it? I mean, it, are, are these apprenticeships open to everyone? Louise? Should, should I answer that one? Thank, thank yeah. you, Carmen. Yeah, I think what, what I heard you ask is, are the apprenticeships open to, to everyone? Yeah, we, what we're trying to do is direct the funding to that underrepresentation. But it's not happening in every case. So, um, and how do you define underrepresentation? It's a very, very broad term. So, we're just making sure that we are seeking opportunities in the right places. And when Tiana shared their strategy earlier, some of the work that Tiana is doing in City and Girls is how we're approaching it through a co op levy share lens as well. So, um, we're not looking to discriminate against anybody in that regard at all. Thank you. Thanks, Lee. Carmen, for the question. Um, any other questions? I was wondering um, how, what the percentage of if you put in a request, how many get turned down or accepted? Great one. Sandra, do you want to come in on that yeah, one? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so are, we, are, we, are you actually asking there then about uh, registrations um, and, and, and the opportunities? So it's sort of registrations and opportunities. Um, I haven't declined any <laughs> in, in 12 months. Um, so that, that's, I mean, 
don't get me wrong, you know, we do check um, sort of do a, a very small amount of due diligence, uh, make sure that the company exists, business exists, uh, charity exists, um, make, make sure that that exists, have they got a website, just so that really everybody then knows that's using the portal, knows that at least those businesses exist. Um, but no, I haven't, I certainly haven't turned uh, anyone away um, that, that's actually registered onto the portal. And, and sorry, follow up. <laughs> so could we put in a request for, for one apprentice? Yes. 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 Okay, cool. Yeah. Amazing. I mean, yeah, from, from we, we've got um, opportunities on, on, the, on the portal there from one to 30 and, and upwards, Amazing. you know, um, I think in even one, um, we had like a hundred, there was a hundred apprentices um, that the opportunity covered, you know, so, and it's only really just making sure that when you actually post that opportunity, that it actually highlights what the opportunity is. And if it is more than one apprentice, uh, just make sure when, when you're posting that if it's, you know, one at level three, one at level four, make sure that that's actually described in, in the opportunity. That said, don't worry if you don't, because I will contact you anyway uh, to make sure what those figures are. So it's just then, like I say, so that other the donating organisations know exactly what they what they're supporting. Amazing, thank you. Thanks for that, Rosemary. I'm just going to stick with Sandra if, if that's okay to you. So we've had a question um, from Jane, um, just asking around the actual time frame. Um, so from when an organisation submits an application, um, how long do they have to wait before finding out if they've been successful? Uh, well, it, that, that's a little bit twofold, really, to, uh, to be truthful. Um, one, once uh, a registration is made, I like to make sure that that registration is approved um, generally within 24 hours. Um, so, so the approval of the registration will, will be made almost instantly. Um, however, the approval for the support um, can take anything from, I mean, I think the quickest one that we had uh, a few months ago was something like 27 minutes um, from actually uh, me actually um, approving the opportunity to actually me being able to uh, find a donating organisation for that. Um, the other answer to that really is without being awful, how long is a piece of string? You know, sometimes it can take like say minutes, sometimes it's days, sometimes it can be weeks. And, and the sad thing, I think, I can't guarantee that that support will be found because as, as Louise and, and, and others have said already, it's really down to the donating organization as to who they want to support. Don't get me wrong, I will, <laughs> I try to push as much as I can um, to get that support through. Um, but yeah, but going back to the initial question from registration to approval of that registration, it's generally 24 hours um, to actually getting the support can sometimes take, uh, you know, a, a long, not as so much a long time, but can sometimes take uh, several, several weeks to, to get that support. Perfect. Thank you, Sandra. I think we've just got one more that is kind of around from your end to kind of expectations. A great one from Jazz. Um, just asking about kind of expectations when money has been um, granted to kind of been accepted by a company. Are there any kind of expectations on terms of feedback or evaluation um, that need to be provided from the awarding um, organisations? Are there any kind of reports they have to produce? No, no, not really. It's it's more, I think, more the reports are, are for myself and the co-op, really. Um, any um, as as again as Louise, you know, we, we're trying we're trying to bridge that gap of underrepresentation. So certainly on on registration, uh, there's a very simple stencil that I send out um, for them to actually complete uh, on bit, you know, for the apprentices that are actually um, coming on to the apprenticeships. Um, but certainly, I think it, it makes that contact, though, easier should um, the donating organisation want to know a little bit more um, about um, the apprentice that they're, they're supporting or apprentices that they're supporting. They can use me as the conduit uh, to actually get any information that, that they want. So quite often, uh, I would say more inquiries come via me 
than than direct to the company but then you know contact can quite often then be made um certainly for um you know as green core and um william uh, yeah yeah no, sorry green core and autism initiatives there that that contacts there um, so should they want to talk to either one of them that that contact contact is there, you know, but as for reporting, as, you know, certainly as far as I know, um, the donating organisation doesn't particularly ask the um, the organisation that they're supporting for for any any records or anything. It's more really, I would say that they would want to get involved um, with, with the, um, the support that, that's actually being given. Perfect. Thank you, Sandra. Um, I think we've got time for one last question. Um, and Laura and Matlis are made too, which are both great. And they're about um, more the receiving organisation side. So maybe if one of the receiving orgs wants to jump on. Um, but it was really just about we often hear that small business and charities don't always have the kind of the time to actually accommodate taking on apprentice and to kind of give them all the support that they need. Um, are there any kind of is there any kind of additional support available um, that helps you to overcome that initial kind of induction and help, and help them, them to be, to be part, part of them? Um, part of your organisation. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm I'm happy to answer that one. Um, so I think the key thing to remember with with when you take on an apprentice, um, if you just think of it as it's a job with learning. So you're taking on normally a younger person, a youngish person, um, maybe from school or from college. Um, perhaps it's their first job. So it's about thinking about how you can train that young person to, to do the role that you need them to do. So it might be because you've got a skills gap there. It might be because you've got somebody coming up for retirement. So it's about making sure that you train that young person. What the training providers and the college do, so for example, with, with our training providers and colleges, they add value to that apprenticeship. Um, but they're absolutely brilliant at the training providers, the colleges, the universities at helping you to train that young person. So first and foremost, it's your responsibility to train them to do the job you're paying them to do. But then they'll do qualifications as well. But if you pick a really good training provider or college, they'll work with you to support the apprentice. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you so much, Kerry. Um, I think that is kind of taken us to one minute left of her afternoon, everybody. Um, so once again, just a massive thank you um, to all of our speakers. A special thank you to Louise and Sandra for being my co-hosts today. Um, we hope you found this session useful. Um, and if you do want more information about the Carp Levy Share, um, we'll pop a link to that in the chat just before we close. Um, but have a good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you.